Good evening. Um, I'm David Levine. I'm co-chairman of Science Writers in New York. I'd like to thank um, Joseph Bonner, who's behind the scenes, my co-chair, um, who produces the show and, and puts it on YouTube. My guest tonight is John Cohn, who's a widely publicized magazine writer. He's the author of four nonfiction books on scientific topics. He's a senior correspondent with Science Magazine and has written for The New Yorker, The Atlantic Monthly, The New York Times, BuzzFeed, Smithsonian. I think he's written for everybody. He's also been on PBS NewsHour, The Today Show, The Larry King Show, and NPR and BBC. Um, John, you want to come and join us? Thank you. Hi, David. And, and hi, John. Thank you. Um, yeah. John, John was actually said, be quiet. I'm working on a story. So <laughs> he specializes in, um, okay, so he, you've been covering epidemics, HIV, AIDS, and COVID-19 for a long time. Um, so I guess you're kind of busy right now. Yeah, this virus was sort of made for me. I, uh, I've never worked harder, and it, it really brings together everything I've been working on since I was about 20 years old and uh, first became a science writer. Okay. Um, so I like to start with the numbers of worldwide, there are 1.36 million cases, um, 425,000 deaths in the United States. Um, we have, um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure these numbers are accurate for the United States. 100,000 cases, yeah. So it's spreading, uh, talking about, the, we can talk about the variants. So you've been following this since the beginning. Uh, when, when did you file your first story? I first got a Slack message from uh, one of the editors I work with, Martin Ensrink, on January 8th. And okay. my life changed uh, that day. Um, I think the first story filed January 9th. It might have filed the 8th. Um, my, my good friend, Helen Branswell, teases me that she had two stories before I had my first, my first one. Um, and uh, I have filed in the past year um, 150,000 words, which is about three times as much as I usually do in a year. And I'm usually very productive at 50, 60,000 words. So my fingers feel like they need to be replaced at this point. Um, I, I think part of what has happened is I, I, I feel very useful. I'm part of a team. Everyone at Science uh, turned into a COVID-19 reporter. And it's been exciting to be with a group of people who are so committed to um, getting it right and uh, doing stories that are original. And um, we, we march to our own drummer at Science, which I like a lot. And I often feel really proud that we're kind of the little engine that could. Um, we go up against the big dailies and everyone else with um, far fewer resources. And we continue to produce work that um, enters the conversation and, and helps help shape it, which I think is one of the most satisfying things as a journalist. Um, why don't you just tell us a little bit about Science Magazine, that it's, um, it's yeah. under the auspices of, auspices of the AAAS? Yeah, Science Magazine was uh, started in part by Thomas Edison. It goes way back. And it began as a journal for original research and for scientists, mm -hmm. not as a news organization. And it transformed into half news, half original research in the 1970s. Loads of the, of the world's best science journalists have uh, passed through Science Magazine at some point. Um, many of us who've been there have stayed for decades because it's a good home for science writers. And uh, we now have, I think about 40 people on staff around the world. I'm based in San Diego. The magazine is based in uh, Washington, DC at the headquarters of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. It's a nonprofit. Um, it's not sold on the newsstand. And you know, when we were a print magazine, uh, we had a pretty restricted audience because you had to pay a steep fee to get a subscription. And with the advent of the internet, um, 
everyone can read us now. Uh, it also means that as journalists, it means we've all turned into wire service reporters. I had the luxury of working at Science for years as a weekly magazine reporter, where you know you turn in an 800 word to a thousand word story once a week back in the day. Um, that was luxurious, uh, but that's no longer what we are. We now do 24 seven essentially. And because we have people all over the world, if I have a story filing at midnight my time, there's somebody up in Europe who can edit it, you know, if need be. Well, I think the biggest surprise for me when you know writing stories is that they're online and people write comments. And sometimes editors want you to actually address some of these comments. Yeah, we 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 stopped doing that long ago. Okay. We stopped encouraging comments. You know, and largely Twitter, I think, has become a much better space to discuss stories mm -hmm. and uh, and you can waste a lot of time yelling, arguing with people. I, I get attacked, um, you know, almost every story I write, someone attacks me it's through Twitter. I kind of, I welcome it. Thank you for reading me. Um, I hope you're doing well during these difficult times. I'm sorry you didn't like my story. You know, I, I don't see any reason to debate everyone about their politics or their religious views. And, and and that's not my job. So, I mean, the biggest story has been lately about the variants. So are you writing about that? Um, well, we are. Kai Kupferschmidt has uh, taken over that aspect for us. We try to divide things up uh, so that different okay. reporters have different beats. I work very closely with Kai. I speak with Kai almost every day. He's based in Berlin. And we co-author some stories. But I've, I've, I've pretty much, and Meredith Wadman has been covering that for us as well. So I've pretty much uh, focused on other things right now because they're, they're covering that front. Um, and there's no, there's no need for all of us to do the same thing. Well, since, since you, you've been covering and writing about this since February, um, why don't you walk us through what, what, what has changed when you first heard about it and what, I mean, which reporting right on now? January. <laughs> January, okay, January, yeah. January 8th. I mean, when I started writing about it, the reason I started writing about it is because the Wall Street Journal did a story that said there was a novel coronavirus behind this outbreak. I had known about the outbreak for days mm -hmm. and we had discussed it and said, well, you know, these things often are just blips. They don't mean anything. It initially looked like it was in the seafood market. They closed the market. Maybe it was just some odd thing that happened. When the Wall Street Journal reported that it was a novel coronavirus, every alarm bell went off because that's what SARS was, that's what MERS was. And we knew how devastating those um, diseases were. And it also, once again, immediately raised the question about China's transparency. Why is the Wall Street Journal telling us this on January 8th? Come January 10th, a Chinese research group through an Australian researcher posts the first sequence of the virus on virological.org, a website for geeky virologists who followed genetic trees of viruses, a very cool group of people, but it's a weird place to publish the first sequence. And it's coming from an Australian who's working with people in China. Again, it sets off alarm bells. There's something weird going on here. China is not famous for its transparency. And it really badly bungled SARS and took a tremendous amount of criticism for it. I've worked extensively in China doing reporting. Um, I understand how the system works. I covered HIV AIDS in China, which the government also covered up and bungled a, a scandal of uh, a blood plasma transfusion that the government was involved with that led to the infection of many people that the government attempted to cover up. But I, but I know too from working in China that the leading Chinese researchers aren't their government, just as we as Americans are not our, I am not Donald Trump. Um, and for that matter, I'm not Joe Biden. We aren't our leaders. And uh, I was speaking with people I knew in China very early on. And it was extremely confusing. It was hard to get the story out. But as a journalist, you know, if you throw up you know, you throw up a roadblock, I'm going to work hard to get around it. And, and the team, we formed a team very early on to try to get 
information that was original. And we learned in January, I, I think Kai and I, or Den, we have a correspondent in China, Dennis Normiel, and I think Dennis and I did a story on January 14th that quoted Jeremy Farrar saying, this could be a, this could go global. You know, this is not, this looks serious. So we knew very early on how serious it was. And by the end of January, I was already writing about the um, seafood market not being the origin uh, because I, I, the paper had been published that had data in it that made me question whether it was even really the origin or it was just an amplifier. And uh, in February, uh, WHO had a, a mission um, that went to China um, to do the first exhaustive report of what the pandemic really looked like. And the US government at that point had also made it clear that Donald Trump was more concerned about the economy than about the spread of this. He, on February 25th, held a press conference and said, you know, we're at 15 cases and we're going to be near zero soon. To any of us who were covering it, it was absurd. And Nancy Messonnier, the head of the CDC's um, in respiratory disease uh, division, who we had as journalists relied on for many years with influenza, said that this could become severe in the United States. And, and, and a second press conference was held immediately that day to, to, to kind of counteract that. And, and then she was muzzled. So screwy things started to happen in the United States. And that, of course, just made us work harder to figure out what was going on behind the scenes. And the mixed messages coming out of the White House became, became the story, um, unfortunately, because the data didn't match and the response didn't match. Um, in March, I, I've, I've, I've covered HIV AIDS for, since the 1980s. I, I, and many of the people at the front of the COVID-19 response, it turns out, are people I know from the HIV AIDS world. And, and I've known Tony Fauci for many, many years. And Tony spoke with me very candidly in March about his frustrations with the Trump administration. And we ran that as a Q&A. That went viral. Um, and uh, <laughs> he, he said something along the lines to me about, because I was pressing him and saying, come on, Tony, you're being, you're being used as a prop. What's going on? Why are you standing there doing this? Why aren't you? And, and he said, what do you want me to do? Push him down when he's at the microphone? And, and he was very candid with me about his frustrations. Um, we started to do stories about, uh, I did a big story in maybe April or March about animal models for the disease. And by April, I was writing about the first vaccines. Um, entering human trials and the first vaccine working in a monkey model, uh, that we were doing stories about treatment from very early on. I was doing the diagnostic fiasco story uh, early on. Um, and then, you know, come June or July, we, we had a whole shift in our staff. So as I mentioned, everyone became a COVID-19 reporter. And we started to publish really good stories about schools that I, I wasn't part of that, but the teams at Science did. A really great story we ran by a team at Science about the pathology of the virus, how exactly it moved through the body and what damage it did. There were unknowns everywhere you turned. Um, and then come July, the first uh, June, July, the first efficacy trials were launched of vaccines. And vaccines are my first love. I, I wrote a book. Um, uh, about the search for an AIDS vaccine, shots, shots in the dark. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to sell it. It came out in 2001. I mean, if you want to buy it, go ahead. And I'm proud of the book. But I spent 12 years working on that. So I, 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 got, I got into science writing as a kid because of vaccines. So I kind of threw myself at the vaccine story. I began working with a crew making a documentary for HBO with filmmaker David France about the COVID-19 vaccine effort. And I, that's, I do that on the side, um, shooting my interviews. I was really, in June, I was really fortunate and allowed to go to an ICU to do a story about a doctor running an, a, a COVID, the busiest COVID-19 ICU in San Diego. And one of the difficulties being a journalist, 
during this pandemic is not going out of your house. You know, I mean, this, I'm a field reporter. I love to go places and describe things and see things. And I always notice stuff that I can't see on Zoom. <laughs> Right. And uh, and come September, I went on my first trip. I went uh, a, re a real trip where I went to Washington D.C. I met with Fauci. I met with him at his home. He was very kind. Invited me over for a socially distanced uh, interview and dinner. Uh, and I went to um, Cincinnati with the head of Warp, the heads of Warp Speed, with Monsef Salawi and General Perna, Gus Perna, to watch them visit a Moderna vaccine trial site. And then I met with community people in Cincinnati about the very difficult uh, racial issues and disparity issues that the vaccines um, are still having to confront. Uh, I did a story that I worked on for many months about China's COVID vaccine, 19, uh, COVID-19 vaccine effort, which I think deserves a lot more attention. And then we had this crazy flood of stories in October, November, December, about, first of all, the tension between Trump wanting vaccine authorizations in October prior to the election and the FDA and the vaccine companies saying, hey, we are gonna follow the data. We're not gonna be pushed into um, prematurely giving data for a, a, an emergency use authorization. And then early in November, every Sunday night, it became another vaccine efficacy trial that was going to be embargoed until Monday morning. So week after week, I wrote one story where my lead was something like for the third Sunday in a row, we're getting, you know, great news. We got Pfizer, Moderna, we got, we, then we got AstraZeneca and Oxford, um, and, and, and we got the Gamalea from Russia and Sinovac and Sinopharm from China, one after the other started to report their efficacy data. And sorting through all that became a really complex story. Okay, um, so I'm, going to, I'm going to stop you for a second. Yeah, I'm done. I've, um, I've walked you through the entire year. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Um, you, you asked, uh, you know. Uh, well, it makes my job easier. Uh, okay. Anyway, um, so if you have a question in, for, the, for our audience, please put them in the Q&A box, which is on the bottom and we will get to them. Um, so um, I guess I'll, you know, since you did work on you know, HIV vaccine, um, are you surprised that we have a COVID-19 vaccine? We have, do we have COVID-19 vaccines that appear to be effective? No. Um, when I saw the report from China and WHO in February, mm -hmm. and Kai Cooperschmidt and I did a big story about it, I recognized that most people who became infected with this weren't harmed and that severe disease was you know re really constrained for the most part to people who had comorbidities or were elderly and and so was death so what that told me was that the immune system for the most part could handle this virus most people and we knew increasingly that asymptomatic inf infection was common so uh, that isn't what you see with hiv uh, with very few exceptions, people who get infected or exposed to HIV are infected for life. Um, most people clear SARS-CoV-2 in a pretty short time, and most people have mild, if any, symptoms. And what that means for a vaccine is that you're not setting the bar that high. It means the immune system can handle this. You just got to figure out um, <clears throat> how to make a safe preparation um, that, that uh, somehow triggers that immune response that mimics what we do naturally. Well, I mean, I don't want, I know you're, I don't want to downplay the virus. I mean, the country's going on lock, been going on lockdown. You know, California was on a very strict lockdown, um, even banning outdoor dining. Um, there are riots in Denmark, of all places, because they are upset that they're having restrictions. France has a curfew at 6 p.m. Yeah. And the, and, and the death I, rates have been very high recently. Oh, David, I, I hear you. It's a dangerous yeah. virus. It causes yeah. mayhem. It wreaks havoc. Okay. But the, from the eyes that our immune system has, it's a wimp. It's not that big of a deal for our immune systems. It's a big deal for societies. And it has devastated societies because um, of how readily it transmits. It's really easy to move from person to person. 
HIV doesn't move that easily from person to person. Um, but this is a respiratory virus, it moves easily. And that means that even though severe disease and death is somewhat rare, it becomes very common when infections get into the tens of millions, hundreds of millions. I mean, that's, that's the problem. So I know you're not really writing about the variants, but do you think the variants are posing a greater danger or are they just more infectious? Oh, oh I, I spend a lot of time reading about the variants. And okay. yeah. even though I'm not taking the lead in writing those stories, um, all viruses mutate, all, all RNA viruses mutate at the same rate. Mm -hmm. Coronaviruses, in comparison to other RNA viruses, don't accumulate mutations at a particularly high rate for two reasons. Um, and if you want, I can explain why. Uh, influenza accumulates far more mutations more rapidly. Right. Mutations, of course, are a concern and there's usually an evolutionary trade-off for a variant that has a mutation and becomes better at transmitting. It loses the ability to do something else. Uh, mutating around an immune response is a pretty difficult thing for a, virus, for a virus to do. The easy thing to do is to mutate to become more transmissible. So it's clear that there are several isolates that transmit better. And it's clear that the South African isolate has a mutation also seen in Brazil that um, makes it more difficult for antibodies to stop the virus. But antibodies are one part of the immune response. And we, for simplicity, focus on antibodies. Mm -hmm. The real world, the reality of an immune response is antibodies are important. They might even be the lead player in an immune response but there is cell-mediated immunity, which isn't about antibodies. Antibodies, for the most part, prevent viruses and other pathogens from getting inside of cells because they glom onto them and the spike protein on coronavirus is what it uses to dock onto our cells and an antibody can block that. But after an infection occurs, we have a whole T cell system that mops up what antibodies failed to do. And that system isn't all that vulnerable to mutants because it doesn't really care all that much what the virus looked like that got into the cell. It knows the virus is in the cell and it targets and eliminates the cell. So you have to balance the way you think about the threat of mutants and our immune response against the way our immune response actually functions which isn't simply about antibodies. Okay. So, so, you know, everyone I know is like trying to get um, the vaccine and, and booking their, their spot. And it's, it's yeah, kind I'm, of like, I'm, it's, I'm begging for it. I'm only 62. It's the it's, first it's time in my life I wish I was older. It's kind of like, a, you know, trying to get a Bruce Springsteen ticket. People are getting up at, you know, five in the morning and they're they yeah. have three browsers open. They have their phone browser open. Yeah. and booking a spot. And many people are saying that's kind of unfair to, like my mom has a flip phone. You know, she, she, she's not computer savvy. She would call me up and say, I read an email, it disappeared. You know, that, she, would, she would have no idea how to do this. Yeah. So, so um, but the vaccine rollout has been pretty bad throughout the world, right? It just, it just, United States is not the only place that's yeah. having problems. Uh, there, there, are two, there are two major problems. One problem is supply. <laughs> that's, <laughs> That's the main problem. The supply is low, the demand far outseeds supply. But the other problem, and the United States has proven this, is um, you need a good system to get vaccines from a factory into people's arms. And right. we don't have that system. And we bungled this badly. We knew, anyone, anyone who covers public health knew that our public health system was fractured. And use Israel as a good comparator. They have basically four HMOs that most everyone belongs to. Everyone has a medical electronic record. Yes, it's a small country. It's fewer than 9 million people. Yes, there are disparities between Arabs and Jews. I'm not going to argue everything's perfect. But they've been able to roll out vaccines with great efficiency. The, national, uh, the NHS in, in the UK similarly has a centralized system 
we have resisted, you know, universal health care. And this is a price we pay for not having a unified system. And furthermore, the Trump administration was very clear that it thought its response toward the pandemic was to help states and counties and cities do what they needed to do, but not to take a centralized directive role. And the Biden administration came in and said, we think that's a mistake. And we think the vaccine rollout proves it. So we'll, we'll now see what happens. And it is a mess. And I, I fought hard to get the vaccine for my 91 year old mother, um, which struck me as ludicrous. Um, I'm, she did end up getting vaccinated, not because of what I did. And I'm fighting hard now so that I can get the vaccine as soon as possible because I wanna travel and go into clinics and go put myself at risk. Um, so it's a serious occupational hazard for me. I cover infectious diseases on the ground in real time. I've done that you know, for many, many years and I'm willing to take risks, but I certainly think it's irresponsible for me or others to take these risks and put others at risk. Um, and I don't wanna do that. So I have some questions from the audience and I don't have a lot, so please, um, I would hope you would um, type in some more Q and A's. So which vaccine would you prefer to take? The mRNA vaccine such as Pfizer and, and Moderna um, John, or Johnson and Johnson and Johnson if authorized. Um, now, so do you, have a, do you have a preference to your vaccine? I think we've all been a bit um, sold on a narrative that a vaccine that has 95% efficacy is better than one that has 78% efficacy. Um, the reality is that these efficacy trials are measuring as the endpoint symptomatic disease, mild disease. Mm -hmm. All of them, even the one that has the lowest efficacy, Sinovac 50%, all of them have 95% to 100% efficacy against severe disease and death. I would take any vaccine um, that has 95 to 100% um, efficacy against severe disease and death. It's better than what I have right now in my body. And if we later learn that the 95% efficacy translates to a vaccine that better prevents transmission, which we don't know right now, then I would go get boosted with that later. Uh, I mean, I, I, think we're, I think we're kind of in a goofy place right now where the standard, the bar was set so high by the first reports of 95% that we, we created this concept that that's the best and that's what we need. Don't, don't, let, the, don't let the good, you know, don't let the, the perfect be the enemy of the good. I mean, it's, we have a lot to benefit, a lot of us to benefit from having more vaccine right now um, that prevents severe disease and death 95 to 100% of the time. I don't know what Johnson & Johnson is going to report, and I don't know what their side effects are. It's always a risk-benefit equation. And if it's 95% efficacy, it tells me that the benefit is really high. So I'm willing to accept more risk. Um, but there are risks, there always are for any vaccine. And it's a data-driven process and decision. But, but David, I wanna point out something else. If I had you over for cereal in the morning and I told you that I had 2% um, milk and I had three different varieties of 2% milk, I doubt you would care which one I pulled out of the fridge. You, you no. might not want whole milk and you might not want skim milk, but you don't go, oh, give me the Altadena because that's the only one I drink. We don't think of milk that way. And you cannot tell me the manufacturer of any vaccine that's in your body and what percent efficacy it had in an efficacy trial. We've entered into this goofy world where we know these data and we think they empower us somehow. And I think they confuse people in a lot of ways. What do you think about the um, suggestions that in England they're you know they're, they're they're trying to vaccinate everybody and and they're going to give the second dose maybe twelve weeks? In the United States they've talked about that too that it's okay to get it four weeks later six weeks and before before it was you know very strict protocols three weeks Pfizer four weeks Moderna. Yeah. It's, it's I think that 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 confuses people too. 
It does, it does. And it's tricky oh. because the intervals that we use in vaccine dosing are all over the place. If you look at the childhood immunization schedule, it's not like we know what the best interval is. And when, when, we, when we take a new vaccine, we do what's called a dose ranging study. And we test it at 30 micrograms, 60 micrograms, 90, and we find the dose that looks the best. We don't do that with intervals. We don't go, hey, let's try a boost at a month. Let's try one at two months. Let's try one in six months. And in this pandemic, we wanted the most robust immunity we could get as quickly as possible. That's why we have these short 21 day, 28 day boosts, 14 day boost in the case of, of, um, of Sinovac at one point. Those are not ideal, we know that, we know that. But you're racing a mutating virus that may well get around a vaccine or may well be reduced in its ability to transmit if you have a vaccine. So it, it's, 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 a, it's a competition. You may well create an opportunity for mutation if you're not fully protected. So I don't know the answer at the end of the day about what should be done. I don't see compelling evidence that a single dose of Pfizer or Moderna offers protection above about 50% against mild disease because that's all we can really see in the database. They could have more, they could have higher levels of protection. What I do see in the data is something I don't think most people understand and that's really startling. And you can look at this data in the Pfizer um, document that they submitted to the FDA and made public on December 10th, that after one dose, older people over 65 hardly make any antibody, any neutralizing antibody against the virus, yet they have good protection against disease. And that's true also in younger people, they don't make really robust levels of antibody. So it's probably T cell immunity is my guess that offers that first bolus of protection and that booster shot antibodies go through the ceiling. And you can see those data and make up your own mind about what it means. I, I'm not sure anyone knows, but it's, it's, real, it's really head turning. So someone asked about long-term potential side effects and I guess, I, I don't think we know. We don't, we, we, how, how would we know? No, we don't. Most, most side effects with most vaccines occur within the first two months. Um, okay. So the most obvious problems uh, we would have seen by now, and, and we're now into you know, millions of people, not 30,000 in an efficacy trial, but you know, 30 million. I mean, we're, we're getting way, way up there in terms of the number of doses that have been administered. And as time goes on, more rare side effects will surface. That's what happens. And then determining whether the side effect is linked to a vaccine, there's a whole field of law that tries to adjudicate whether it's, it's caused by harm is caused by vaccines. Vaccines are tricky. They're going into healthy people. And so any, you know, there's, there's a vaccine um, pediatrician researcher, uh, Kathy Edwards, who told me a story about a kid whose parents were very, very worried about getting the child vaccinated and finally were convinced to do it. And the day they came in, the doctor wasn't there, got sick and couldn't vaccinate or the nurse wasn't there, the clinic was closed and the child died a few days later. If the vaccine had been, vaccines had been put into the child that day, you know that the parents would have been convinced forever that the vaccines did it. So how do you separate out causation and correlation? It's tough, it's tough. I think we know for certain right now that the risk benefit equation is this virus is far more dangerous than the vaccines. And someone told me that they're afraid of the side effects. And I said, well, COVID-19 has some pretty bad side effects. Exactly. I, I would much mm -hmm. rather take the risk of a vaccine than the risk of becoming infected. And I think that as humans, we have a really hard time understanding risk and benefit. You know, we, we get on airplanes and worry about flying, not understanding that our drive to the airport had a far higher risk of causing harm. But that's how we think. We, we just don't really, you know, as I'm speaking for all of us, we don't really deal well with uh, intuitively with risk and benefit. 
So do you think President Biden will authorize the Defense Production Act to build a better pipeline for producing the more, the vac more vaccines quicker? Yeah, I mean, he said as much, but the, the, the question then becomes sort of a deeper question of what does it mean to build a vaccine manufacturing plant? Um, you know, it's a big deal to build a plant from scratch. And it's an even bigger deal when it's a technology that's never been used to make huge supplies of a product. These mRNA vaccines have never been produced at scale by anyone, anywhere. How do you train people to do it? It's not like you snap your fingers and bring in the army, get this done. Come on, I want it tomorrow. It doesn't work that way. That's, uh, that's just this weird sort of Hollywood fantasy. The, the reality is it takes several months to build a plant. The supplies of the key pieces of equipment used to make any specific vaccine are going to be specific to that vaccine. And the training learning curve of people to make a new product is pretty steep. There, it's not, it's not, this is not like opening up a bakery to make sourdough. That's not what it is. When will we know whether vaccinated people can spread the, the virus? It's tough. Um, the studies have sub studies to analyze that question, to look at transmission. They should be reporting some data um, in the next month or so. I, my own sense is we will see the impact in some communities um, that are isolated um, more quickly than we'll see it elsewhere. I think there'll be some surprises as to how we answer the question. You know, it, there can be outbreaks like on, we saw this on cruise ships or on naval ships that have thousands of people that end up telling us a lot about transmission and transmission patterns. And I think we're gonna see stuff like that. I don't know how it's gonna happen or where, but I think there are gonna be some accidents of nature that answer the question as well. What's the status of vaccines that don't require the deep refrigeration of the current two we use in the United States? Any well, word on possible? Okay. Well, it's only Moderna and Pfizer that require sub-zero temperatures. Nothing else but, does. But Moderna is less than Pfizer, isn't it? Yeah, but it's still sub-zero. It's minus 20. Um, I, I don't, you know, it doesn't make a great deal of difference if you're minus 20 or minus 70. Um, it'll be much easier when we have vaccines that don't require sub-zero temperatures and the rest of them don't. Um, would it be even better if the vaccine didn't require any refrigeration, which is true of some vaccines? Yeah, that'd be great. And we'll get there, we'll get there. You know, I think, I think there's, we, we've kind of pushed our expectations so ridiculously high because we did this thing in such a short period of time. You know, the HIV vaccine doesn't exist to this day. And I first wrote an article about HIV vaccines in 1989. So 31 years ago, I, I wrote my first article about AIDS vaccines and we don't have one. I wrote my first article about COVID-19 you know, in January, uh, we have a vaccine proved safe and effective in November. Are you kidding me? You know, come on, let's, let's be a little more generous in our expectations of knowing answers to questions that are very difficult to answer. So this is from Gerald Posner, who's been our guest twice and, and you know him as well. Hi, Gerald, yeah. yeah. So I'm uh, wondering if what you think about this, that the spotty genomic sequencing efforts in some countries might hamper efforts to keep timely track of variants. Most of these variants aren't, we are not aware of until it's too late to contain them. It's a huge problem. And uh, we have the technologies to do better genomic surveillance. We often don't have the coordination or the will or the resources to do it. Um, would it help if everywhere uh, behaved like, let's say, the United Kingdom and really aggressively did sequencing? 
Absolutely. And would it help if we had technologies that were simpler and cheaper and faster? Absolutely. Um, I think we'll get there in the future. And I think this is also teaching us about our shortcomings. So I, I agree that it would be far better to understand mutants and uh, have more sequence data. W without question, it would be far better. The, but there's a but clause here. And, and the but clause is that oftentimes we discover mutants after they've really spread pretty far and wide. So it's a timing issue. You, you know, how, how do you contain spread? What do you do? We witnessed something that I think much of the world has yet to really accept, and it's China and what they did. China stopped its epidemic between shutting down Wuhan on January 23rd and March 8th. They shut down their pandemic. China has gone back to normal for the most part without a vaccine long ago. Mm -hmm. And if we wanted to do what we consider to be draconian things, like taking every person who tests positive and putting that person in a gymnasium away from their family for two weeks and requiring you to have a red, yellow, green status on your smartphone before you can travel anywhere, go to the store, having people report on you if you violate curfews, uh, you know, the intense surveillance and monitoring that China does, the intensive diagnostics that they do, testing entire cities, 11 million people in a week, we could contain mutants far more readily because we would be containing transmission. So it's not simply a matter of having better sequencing to prevent mutants from spreading far and wide. It's about doing better testing and contact tracing and isolation of cases. And we have shown in the United States that we don't want to do what China did. We just don't. Well, no, one thing I've seen, um, New York City, people do wear masks. They're pretty compliant. But people are not very good at social distancing. I mean, I, I went to a museum the other day. Our museums are open. It's about the only thing that you can do. And I saw, I saw, I saw like 15 people hovered around a painting. I said something to the guard. He said, I don't, we don't know what to do. We, we asked them, we asked people to, but we'll be doing this all day long. So, I said to uh, Fauci in my interview in March of last year, why are you guys all clustering in the press room like that? You know better. What are you doing? I mean, it, it, it's, it's not our style and our nature. And we also have fatigue. Everyone is sick of the pandemic, whether they're sick of the virus or not, sick from the virus, they're sick of it. And, and people have been letting down their guard. And then I said long ago, this is an accordion. We're playing an accordion, you know, and we're, we're going to get stricter about shutdowns, lockdowns as things get worse, and then we'll open up and then we'll close it, and then we'll open up. But we don't want to do the strict sort of contact tracing, isolation and testing that China does. So we need biomedical devices to help us through including genomic monitoring at scale. So someone says, I've been a science reader for 20 years and appreciate your reporting. So a nice comment. Is Thank science- you. Wait for the buzz. <laughs> no, is sci no, are you, is science, are you um, covering the possible future spillovers from animal hosts into humans? Well, we, we have. For, for decades, that's our bread and butter. Um, okay. you know, Kai Kuferschmidt went with Vincent Munster to Congo a few years ago to do bat spillovers. And uh, you know, I've written about, I, I went around Gabon with a researcher bleeding monkeys years ago for a story for science, looking for different retroviruses that could spill over. We've done this for decades. And yeah, it's, it's an important topic. Um, I love doing the, the field reporting on spillover stories. It's fascinating. Um, so yes, ab absolutely. And it remains, you know, look, this, this virus, this pandemic's a wake-up call. We've been doing this stuff for a long time. We have not, as a world, been taking science seriously enough. We weren't listening enough. Well, I mean, there was a pandemic. The Hong Kong flu was in 1968. 
And I don't really remember it, to be honest. I mean, um, they had Woodstock. I, I in, they, had, <laughs> they, had, they, they had Woodstock in 1969, but yeah, but you would have, yeah, I think you would have remembered being locked down. And you would have meant that, that nothing, I mean, you know, it wasn't a political issue. Doctors just, you know, talked about it. And um, yeah, but no, David, you, know, you put your finger on something important. Yeah. And, and that's that we have learned to live with flu. We have 40, 50,000 deaths a year from flu. Our hospitals still function and we don't wear masks and we go, well, it's flu, right? Well, I did ask Dr. Fauci on a, when I was on a call with him um, saying, do you think in retrospect, should people have been wearing masks? You know, he said it's 60,000 a year or something. Should people be, have been wearing masks? He said, I think I said, I would hope so. You know, so, but he's never had. I, I think I'd say to Tony that he's dreaming. I, I think that people want the masks off their faces in the United States. Asia is far more, you know, used to wearing masks in cult and culturally. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think Americans, for the most part, will, as soon as we have higher levels of immunity and potentially better treatments, I think Americans will have a hard time understanding why they still need to routinely wear masks in public. That would be my guess. I, I don't, I, I guess I just don't have that much faith that we are, um, and, you know, come on, who likes a mask? It's, it's not something that's like, wow, this is great. I can put a hat on my head and say, hey, it's great. I like a hat. It blocks the sun. It does things for me. Masks aren't comfortable. They don't help you communicate. They cover up your face. So in fact, you're, you're kind of hiding in a way and you can't read people as well. Um, but, so but, I, I don't. No. The government, the government is not asking you to do very much. I mean, they're just saying, please wear a mask. I'm not saying, you know, go over to Europe and fight a war, you know. So it's... Oh, I, I, I don't misunderstand me. I, I think it's incredibly important that we wear masks right now. And uh, what about what? So what about double masking or KN95? I find these masks, the KN95 is hard to breathe. The N95 is difficult. Um, yeah. I mean, we just don't know how much efficacy a mask offers. If we had an efficacy trial for a mask like we do for vaccines, maybe we would be saying, David, you'd be saying to me, hey, John, you know, I got the alpha beta mask and you've got the Kroger's mask and, you know, this one's got 95% efficacy and that one's got 70 and this one's more comfortable and this one has fewer side effects. But we don't speak about masks that way. We're using these surgical masks, these blue surgical masks that Dr. Kildare wore. No. Okay. When you see old pictures of the influenza pandemic masks in 1917-18, the cloth, cloth masks look like what we're doing today with bandanas and stuff. <laughs> but, but Dr. Kadeo never got COVID, you see? Because yeah. <laughs> he, he was wearing that surgical mask. <laughs> You're saying, thank God I was wearing that mask. Yeah. Um, so can you share what you're working on today? Yeah, I'm working on a, a feature story about vaccines, okay. uh, about COVID-19 vaccines. I don't, I don't want to go into detail about it, but um, it's a story I've been working on for a few weeks that are trying to address what, what we think are some of the more pertinent questions right now that haven't been fully explored. Uh, David, there's something else about COVID-19. It's turned every journalist into a science journalist. I used to be part of a small club of infectious disease reporters, and mm -hmm. now everybody's in on it. And my competition is, you know, incredible. I, I respect what, you know, so many publications are killing it, doing great job, a great job. Uh, and and store, I learn a tremendous amount from reading other publications, um, but it's much easier for me to get scooped. I mean, I have been to let me just give you a quick example. I have been, I went to the World International Hepatitis C Conference in 1999, and my lead was that I was the only journalist there. Mm -hmm. I, <laughs> um, I've been to conferences about incredibly important infectious diseases where I'm, I'm alone. I, I went to the NIH's AIDS vaccine conferences for many years where I was the only journalist there. Um, so everybody's in on it now, and it makes me more cautious about discussing publicly exactly what I'm working on because I don't want to get scooped. Okay. Um, so when do you think the most important writing about the pandemic will come? Not from will shift from journalists to historians. 
I, th I think I think many years from now. <laughs> oh, I I, I don't. Um, I, I I think what happened with COVID and what's still happening is every day became a week. Time took on new meaning. Um, and I've already, I mean, Lawrence Wright had a New Yorker story last week or two weeks ago that's taking a look back in a historical sense, a uh, very detailed, beautifully written story. Yeah, it was like 50 uh, pages. <laughs> yeah, yeah. well, it's almost a book, right? Yeah, right. And, and it's taking kind of a historical look at what happened. So I think everything is happening in warp speed. I think everything is in real time, um, <coughs> moving much faster than information has moved in the past, <laughs> including our attempt to, to write the second draft of history, because journalism is the first draft. Do you think vaccine passports will be required for um, tourism travel? Is I, something I, that should be yeah. well, enforced? You know, I, it's my passport bag, right? I've got my... <laughs> I've got my immunization cards, you know. I have, I have, I have those too. I, you know, a little out of date. Yeah. It, yeah, but it's nothing new, right? Um, it, it's it's been used for a very long time for many diseases. Um, I don't see, I don't see why not. Uh, it, it it makes sense to me. It's logical. Um, it's not going to eliminate risks, but it it's about reducing risk. It's about harm reduction. It's not about this absolute world where we protect ourselves completely. So I, well, I, I think some countries will do that. Yeah, I anticipate. Well, I, I, I know that when you do get your your dose, there's a card they give you where they they stamp it, uh, the date of the dose, and then the second one. Yeah. And you're told not to lose this because that you will need that to get on a plane. You'll need yeah. that to do a lot of things. I, I, but my, I, my I, have a, I have a cousin in Israel who sent me a picture and said hers expires in four months. He said. I don't think I'll be able to travel in the next four months. Yeah, well, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. We're, we're figuring this out on the fly. You know, many people have said we're building the airplane as we're flying it. I, I think that's true. And we keep seeing things that once seemed unfathomable. I remember saying to my family in um, March or so, hey, I bet you're going to see someone wearing a mask at the supermarket here. And they all, ha, ha, ha. you know, that was only, that was less than a year ago that no one in my little community where I live had ever seen anyone wearing a mask unless the person had an oxygen tank next to them or maybe had just come in from Asia and had a different culture. But well, now- the, the culture, I was, on, I was on an airplane and there was a Chinese woman who, she was wearing a mask, her child was wearing a mask, but she refused to put her seatbelt on. And she was escorted from the plane. I have no idea why, but it's like, but I, I see, you know, the Asian populations, they do wear masks before this, this is way before the last few years, uh, they do wear masks on the subways. And it's probably not a dumb idea. No, it's, I mean, I've, I've worked in Asia for, for many, many years. And yeah. I, I used to think uh, sometimes like I would be in Vietnam at a stoplight riding a motorbike and there'd be, you know, 200 motorbikes around me and everybody would have on a mask except for me. And I think, oh, they're so much smarter. There's so many fumes. It was so disgusting to be breathing it. And I thought, well, they know something I don't know. So I don't know. And then I think masks have also been fashion statements in some uh, like Japanese kids were making be, pr prior to COVID. They were making all these different designs on masks. And so I, it's, it's just culturally different. I don't know. So these vaccines were, one thing Trump said, they were uh, done at warp speed. And do you think this will change the way vaccine development, the future of vaccine development? It better. <laughs> it better, okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think we've, if we don't learn from this, um, uh, I don't, I don't know. We, we have to learn from this. We have to. And I think there are a lot of lessons and the vaccines are uh, scream, screaming uh, one lesson at us, and that's that um, we could have made some related vaccines earlier, and we didn't. We could have made SARS and MERS vaccines earlier, and then we could have been into more of an influenza situation where you're just strain swapping. Um, uh, we failed, and I did a story in 2016 for Science called 
unfilled vials, vaccines on ice, that where I polled 50 vaccine experts around the world and asked them, what are the vaccines that we could be developing right now that are sitting in freezers as experimental products that aren't moving forward? It was the cover of Science Magazine, Vaccines on Ice. And SARS and MERS were on the top 10 list. What would have happened if we had had a SARS or MERS vaccine? I think it would have been essentially a strain change to throw in SARS-CoV-2. We could have had a vaccine in my mind if we had those other vaccines, maybe in March, before we even had much virus in this country. I don't know, but I think we have to start thinking that way and asking ourselves to critically evaluate what we did right and what we did wrong. Okay. So I'd like to end like by asking people what they do, because um, so <clears throat> so is San Diego still under lockdown, or no? Oh, California it was lifted a few days ago. Uh, people where I live, I live in a beach town in North County, San Diego, that it was a little more relaxed than I thought we should be about like outdoor dining. I think people were violating regulations right and left. Okay. Um, so. I, I haven't, I, I frankly, I don't go out to restaurants. I don't do that. But tonight I'm going to go um, with my wife to an outdoor uh, dinner party with some friends and we'll sit outdoors. Okay. But we so, live in an area where we can sit outdoors in. So is that your first time doing outdoor dining? No, we've had al fresco dinner parties once a okay. month maybe. But you know, we have one friend, uh, uh, husband and wife, doctor and nurse, where we actually set tables up eight feet apart and talk to each other. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we've done a little of that, but I, I <clears throat> the part we've avoided taking the risks, but we've, you know, we had our children home for the holidays, I had them tested and isolated for a time, but we, we gambled, we took the risk. Um, what, so you have not done, in, you don't, you have not done indoor dining. No, no, nor would I. And I, and I, I went to get my hair cut. My, my hair is a little, what, what little hair I have left was kind of out of control the other day. And I called a barber shop and I said, do you have outdoor um, haircuts? And the guy said, uh, yeah, kind of. And I said, what does kind of mean? And he goes, yeah, yeah, we do. And I went there. They didn't have outdoor haircuts. They have plastic sheets hanging between each booth. And they have four people sitting inside waiting for cuts. And I was like, oh man, no, no. No, so I, I'm I'm very cautious. I I I don't want to I don't want to become infected with this virus. Okay, um, <clears throat> but you did fly to DC. I did in September when the transmission was very low, and okay. I timed it that way, and I was extremely careful. And fortunately, um, I didn't get infected and, uh, and I didn't hurt anyone, which was also a concern of mine. I feel a deep responsibility to not hurt others. And, and, and because I cover infectious disease, I often go into situations that are dangerous. And if I come home, I, I, I have three kids who I raised in, in this house. And, and I always worried about hurting them or my wife with something that I picked up on the road. So I've always been extremely cautious about my own behavior around dangerous pathogens. I think you should be. <laughs> well, I've, but I've masked up and done stuff like that for many years on the road. Right. I, tra I traveled with an N95 mask and latex gloves and Purell for you know decades. And I remember, I remember t taking a tour of a nuclear plant after, <laughs> and uh, they give you a little badge and as, you know if, if you've been exposed to radiation. So, and someone well, said, you know. So. I've twice done stories at a hospital in Durban, South Africa, that has the largest patient population of extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis, mm -hmm. which when I first visited there had a fatality rate of 80%. And it concerned me, <laughs> but I took precautions and, you know, nothing happened. But I, I, take, I take this stuff very seriously. Well, I, I know you have a story that you're working on and you had to finish and it's uh, where you are is three hours earlier. So you, um, so I'm gonna end, end this tonight. I wanna really thank you for uh, spending an hour with us. And my if, if my, I'm just gonna do a little advertising. So Wednesday, February 3rd, I'm gonna be speaking to an infectious disease specialist who only treats patients in the hospital. 
Her name is Dr. Morella Salvatore. She was just at a conference on variants, so I'm very interested in talking to her. And she's at Weill Cornell Medical Center. On Wednesday, February 10th, I'll be speaking to um, Apoorva Mandavili, and she's well known. She's at Science and Global Health Report at the New York Times. That's Wednesday, February 10th. And on February 18th, I'll be speaking to Dr. Mude Cervic. I'm sorry, Dr. Mude Sevic. She's a clinical fellow, Infection and Global Health Division, University of St. Andrews School of Medicine. And she is very active on Twitter, and I was very happy to actually get her to uh, sit down and talk with us. And in March, we're going to um, talk to Carl Zimmer, but he has a new book coming out, and we're also talking to Sherry Turkle about her new book. And we'll send out announcements to everybody. And if any of your friends missed this, this will be up on our YouTube channel. So again, I'm speaking to John Cohen, and I'm sure you'll be writing a book about this at some point. I hope to. Okay. Let's not wait 11 years for it, though. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I, I, thanks for having me. That's quite a roster you have in the future, too, and I'm happy to be included with all those interesting people. Thanks so much. We're, we're very pleased that you could do this. Thank you, and um, stay safe. To you, too. Bye-bye. Good, good luck getting the vaccine. Hey, look how well my dog behaved this whole time. That's pretty unusual. Very good. <laughs> very, very good. Well, well trained. Yeah. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.